But by the time of the book How to Win Friends and Influence People was coming out in the 30s, the introduction to that had morphed it into the pseudoscience of we only use 10% of our brain. But actually, all the research that's been done, the, the ability to look into the brain, how it's functioning, has not found one area yet perpetually silent. Even when you're asleep, your brain is busy. Myth number two. We're born with a finite amount of brain cells. Your neurons are the only cells in your body that can't replace themselves. And when they're gone, they're gone. How many believe that? How many ever believe it? Absolutely. Well, we know now that that's not true, and actually we know something contrary, in fact. Your brain is a work in progress. It's happening every moment that we speak with everything that's going on. And before you were born, your brain was very busy creating neurons. Between the first few months, the first last months, you were in the uterus and the age of two, your brain began pruning away those extra neurons it was creating. Up to half of them were pruned away before you were born. The next big pruning took place at the, um, in the teen years, when again, a huge amount of neurons were pruned. Why was that? Scientists think it's because it's more efficient for your brain, because the information is held among the networks that your brain creates, not necessarily in the brain cells. And this helps you create a lean, keen thinking machine. Some of the newer research on autism, in fact, has found that in some cases of autism, the children have over, over large brains. They have an overgrowth of brain cells, which may contribute to some of the problems they have. So even though by the time you're an adult, you'll lose 70% mm, of the brains that were created in you as a fetus, you don't have to worry. There's still plenty of them left. Oh, in fact, another thing, it isn't just that you have plenty of them left. Your brain is actually creating new neurons. This is a process called neurogenesis. And it's fairly new in the research, and it's, um, it's been mainly researched in rats, but to some extent in humans. In humans, we know that in two parts of the brain, we can create new neurons to replace ones that are missing. Uh, and one of those parts of the brain is the hippocampus, which you as a scientific group know is the part of the brain dedicated to memory and new information. Correct. Um, yes, the rat research. They looked at rats, and they looked at rats who were active. They actually sent them all to rat university. <laughs> half of the rats hung out at the frat house, drinking beer, lolling around, not doing very much. The other half went to school. They ran treadmills, they played with toys, they were very active. When they dissected, or I should say when the rats graduated from rat you, <laughs> and they looked at their brains, they found that the brains of the rats who had been physically active and who had been stimulated with various toys had retained the new neurons, and the rats, who were lolling around not doing much, had not retained them. And we're going to come back to that later when I talk about the myths of the aging brain. Okay. Oh, yes. Your brain is hardwired. It's fixed. It's unyielding. It can't change. How many believe that? You're too smart. How many ever believed it? Yeah, you're a really smart group. Well, we know, as I said, that your brain is a work in progress. Everything that happens to you changes your brain to some extent, just as your brain will change how you perceive things. Uh, as you're listening to me talk, things are changing in your brain. And whether you think it's relevant or not depends on, you know, how long that will stay around in your brain. But uh, this, this is called neuroplasticity. And it's something very useful for you because We've discovered that when something goes wrong with a part of your brain, another part may take over for it. And in cases of stroke, for example, when part of the brain goes dark, you can, with, with, uh, with therapy and things, regain use of another part of your brain to compensate for it. Uh, in fact, in some cases where people have had extreme problems with the brain, epilepsy is one. They've had so many seizures, they have them so often they can't function at all. Sometimes a very drastic surgery is performed in which half of the brain is removed. One of your, one of your hemispheres is completely removed. And what they found in those cases is that, especially when it's done with young people, they can function perfectly normally <coughs> with half a brain. Amazing, but proof. Um, 
Oh, this is one I like a lot, too. The London Cab Drivers. There are two studies. You've heard the London Cab Driver study, right? Again, about neuroplasticity and also neurogenesis. And the Nun study. You know the Nun study? He doesn't. Okay. The, the London Cab Driver one is fairly well known. They looked at the, um, uh, again, the hippocampus, hippocampi, of London Cab Drivers, because back before GPS, they had to really, they were really memorize the uh, very complex streets, and one-way streets in London. And they found that those cab drivers had a larger hippocampus than normal, than most people have. The nun study is interesting. Uh, it's an old one, but, but I think fascinating. A group of nuns at a particular sect had agreed to donate their brains after death. So they were able to be observed as they were growing older and before they died. And then when they dissected their brains after death, they could compare that to what had happened during life. And the fascinating thing they discovered there was that some of the brains were so riddled with disease and so damaged, they could not imagine how this person could function. And yet, for all appearances, that person was functioning fairly normally in the environment that they lived in. So your brain has an amazing ability to heal itself. Uh, number four, your genes are your destiny. Your DNA is fixed. That's the blueprint for who you are and can't be changed. How many believe that? Really? This group's just too smart. How many ever believed it? So, what's happened? What makes us think that's no longer true? Who knows? Oh my God, guys. Yes, epigenetics. Indeed, your DNA comes, you know, your genes, your DNA, your genome is fixed. That's not going to change. But not all of the genes are active, as you know, apparently. And they're not active to the same degree. And there's an epigenome, which means over, which is a, actually a chemical trigger to turn your genes off and on. And so that's why, in cases of identical twins, who often are quite identical, one will get a disease or have something happen in their life that doesn't happen to the other. And it's because perhaps the environmental forces or the toxins or the lifestyle they live somehow turn their genes off or on in a different way. Um, the really fascinating thing about this, which is, which is still being researched quite a bit under a new institute, is that it's been shown that some of these gene changes are actually heritable. That means they can be passed along to their offspring. How many of you do that? <laughs> Nothing I can tell you. <laughs> All right, how about this? Left brain, right brain. Yeah, we have a left brain and a right brain. Right, and they're different? They're, they're different, okay. Because one was rational, right? One was creative, right? So, come on, guys. Absolutely. You go on the internet and it pops up all the time. Left brain, right brain. People have made fortunes with this thing. Um, the two hemispheres are similar, but they're not twins. So they are different to some extent, but not that different. You have some of the same functions in each hemisphere. And actually what research is showing is that in people who's Two hemispheres are connected, but they have a lot of connection across them. Focus colossum, these are the people who tend to be more creative thinkers. So it really isn't a question of a, a right brain, left brain thing. Let's see. Oh, how it may have come about, right. It may have come about because, um, because we know that some parts, some functions are stronger in one hemisphere than the other. But again, no, no left brain, right brain. I'm surprised, guys. Okay, so, mm, what about sleep? We need eight hours of uninterrupted sleep a night. Who believes that? You believe that? Why don't we need eight hours of uninterrupted sleep? Well, we don't actually know that we don't need it, but we suppose that we don't. And this information came from a an interesting congruence of information. Some researchers were looking at uh, at the the life the life attack practices, you know, the daily practices of people over time. But before we had electric light, people went to bed when the sun went down, and they got up when the sun came up. Right? No. No, they did not. When there was no electric light. Yes. Exactly. They would often wake up in the middle of the night, every four hours or so, and they would play a musical instrument, do some dishes, have sex. Uh, who knew? Go back to sleep. So 
they got enough sleep apparently, right? And um, I think those of us today who worry about insomnia, anybody else wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning? What do you do? <laughs> you shouldn't worry if you wake up during the night twice. You probably should go to the bathroom. Because you'll probably end up with enough sleep. Okay, let's see. How about drugs? Alcohol, sex, and rock and roll. <laughs> Are they good for the brain? <laughs> what about drugs? What about marijuana? Is it good for the brain? No. Yes. No. No. Studies are showing that marijuana is toxic to the young brain, the developing brain, which is why I kept telling my physicians, "Don't go till they were in their twenties." But really, it's, it's been shown to be fairly toxic. However, research that they're doing now shows that marijuana for the elder brain is probably pretty good. There was a study actually published in the last month uh, from Israel, but they've been doing a lot of research on the medical benefits of marijuana over the last couple of decades. And in this case, they took our friends, the rats, again. And uh, they took young rats, middle-aged rats, and old rats. Rats don't live very long, so. And they hooked them up to low-dose marijuana, not marijuana, THC. And they kept it at a fairly low level, but constant over a period of time. What they discovered in these rats is that the old brains of the older rats seem to re regress back to a younger state. Now, what that means for human brains, I don't know. It sounds good for older human brains, it's good for older rat brains. But I don't think you could go around with a constant confusion of low level marijuana. But. So what about alcohol? Is alcohol good for the brain? A little bit, aha. Uh -huh. How much is a little bit? However much I'm drinking. <laughs> Right, two drinks for a man, one drink for a woman. There's always inequality. <laughs> really. Hold on a minute. Coming off, I think. Well, if you talk, if you talk to your doctor or mine and say no alcohol, but if you look at some of the research, which you know is not double blind, peer reviewed, all that stuff, uh, uh, you know, control. Really, the research about alcohol use tends to be more uh, retrospective to say what they did, so who knows what they did. But if you look at a bunch of this research over time, it seems to show that, um, is this working okay? Yeah. Yeah. It seems to show that people who are moderate drinkers, and I'm not sure how much moderate is, the people who are moderate drinkers tend to have a later onset or a lower risk of developing dementia at various times. Heavy drinkers, however, did develop the dementia, as we know there's a kind of alcoholic dementia too. Um, some of the other research show, however, that whenever mild cognitive decline started to set in, for drinkers it accelerated. So, I don't know. There was a study that came out a couple of days ago, again, that said um, alcohol is very bad with the brain. It actually increases your risk of dementia, but I think they only had about 23 people that they looked at. So, again, the size of the study one rule of thumb about this is that what's good for the heart is good for the brain. Why would that be? Because of circulation and gets oxygen-rich nutrients to your brain. And drinking a small amount daily seems to lower your risk of heart disease. It seems to keep your heart healthier. So what I would say, and what my doctor said, <laughs> well, if you drink already, I guess you can do it, but you know, don't do too much. And if you don't drink, don't start. So let's see, what about rock and roll? I wish my grandkids played more rock and roll. I tell you, I get pretty sick of rap. If it has heavy metals in it, it could be toxic. Very good. I agree. Absolutely. Well, I've done a lot of research about how how uh, music is very soothing for people, for the brain. And there's been a lot of research. Again, you know, with people saying what they are, nobody's actually dissecting a brain and looking at it, but music does seem to be good for the brain. And of course, rock and roll gets you moving, and exercise is good for the brain. 
So we would say rock and roll is good for the brain. And now we come to sex. Is sex good for the brain? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Why? <laughs> <laughs> sex resides. Exactly. Yeah. Sex does a lot of good things for the brain. Um, it, of course, it accelerates your heart rate, so it, you know, it, it, it gets you, it gets the blood circulating, as we like to say. It relieves stress, eventually. Um, <laughs> it gives you some exercise, and it gives you the benefits of socialization with another person, if you are having sex with another person. <laughs> Again, coming back to our friends, the rats, they've looked at rats, and oh God, those poor little rats. Well, in this case, I, it might have been okay. Um, they had them, they looked at rats that had repeated sexual encounters. And then they looked at their brains after they graduated again. And they found that the rats that had repeated sexual experiences tend again to have healthier brains, to keep more of the neurons in their brain. So all I can say is, have more sex. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing could be bad about that, right? Um, That's the trouble with talking about notes, you forget where you are. Oh, yes, this is a good one. Brain fitness training. Brain fitness training strengthens your brain, lowers your risk of dementia, right? Does anyone believe that? What about crossword puzzles? Yeah, that's good. That's good. I think that's good. Most of the research has been fairly inconclusive, a little bit's been done. You know, this is a multi-billion dollar a year business. Although I think Luminosity was sued recently to make the promises they couldn't fulfill. But um, no, actually brain games only make you better at playing brain games. Yeah. It might improve your short-term memory a little bit, and they found several weeks later it just progressed back to what it was. So there are other things you can do that are good for your brain. I want to talk about those as soon as I find my notes. Let's see. Oh yeah. Back here, um, the way to improve your brain actually is to, to participate in things that are challenging and difficult for you to do and to repeat those things to improve the connections, to strengthen those neural networks and things that you want to do. And that brings us to the myth of the aging brain, which I want to talk about a little bit. Um, this is the best time in history to grow old. <coughs> Mainly because we can grow old. <laughs> there has been enough uh, medical research done. We have enough tools and things to keep us alive longer. In fact, the fastest growing demographic group in the world is centenarians. People 100 years old or older. Um, oh, yes. And the second reason this is a great time to grow old, which I mentioned before, is because we have so many benefits from medicine and technology to help us grow old, right? To help us stay active, to keep our bodies and minds functioning well. And of course, we have our old friends neurogenesis, neuroplasticity, and epigenetics to come up for that, too. But there are still some myths about aging. One of the most prevalent myths about aging is that old people are depressed, regret their past, and make poor workers. Who believes that? Now you realize that depends on who we're talking about. So I'm talking now about old people like myself who are healthy and fairly active. And those people do pretty well in old age. Uh, they, did, um, they did some research, phone research, of more than 300,000 people. And they asked them what time in their life they had been the happiest. And guess what age group they picked? Early 70s. Wow. People in that group said they were happier in their 70s than they had been since they were in their 20s. Wow. Another phone survey of people in their 80s asked if they regretted their past. Fewer than 1% regretted their past. Also, it was um, a research was done comparing the depression rates and suicide rates among elders and people of other age groups. And they found that, again, people who were older, meaning 65 and older, were less depressed than middle-aged people in their middle years. Why would that be? Social security. <laughs> That's going to go soon. What do you do? Sex. We're coming to that next. 
And what do you do in your middle years? What's happening when you're in your 40s? You're working yourself. You've got children at home. Worse yet, I got teenagers at home in my 40s. Um, and you're concerned about your career, you're concerned about money, and when you're older, so many of those things just aren't as relevant. So that even if you don't have a lot of money, if you have a decent level of health, if you don't suffer from a you know, chronic pain or chronic illness, you have a decent income, you're going to be less depressed than people who are half of your age. Um, remind me not to have all these papers next time. Oh, sex, right, sex. So old people are not interested in sex. Where have you been? That finally people are realizing that we like to have sex, you know, until we're dead, probably. Wow. Several assisted living facilities and nursing homes throughout the country are acknowledging that. And it used to be they would be very appalled if elders got together. Uh, but now they're encouraging elders to hook up. In fact, the, the Hebrew nursing home, um, which is in Riverdale outside of New York, has a policy where it allows elders to go into a room alone, shut the door, and even puts a do not disturb sign on the door. They even set up a dating service to connect elders, and they encourage physical contact, because physical contact is so important to us as we grow older. So no, we may be old, but we're not dead yet, as a friend of mine said, under circumstances I won't describe. <laughs> uh, one, one other proof that old people like sex is that the CDC reports a significant increase in STDs in <laughs> people over 65. <laughs> Of course, um, we all worry about dementia, and you're also smart, but you know that Alzheimer's is not the only kind of dementia there is. It's just a casual term. Um, and it's true that some cognitive skills will decline as we get older. There's no doubt about it. Uh, we are going to slow down somewhat. Our brains won't be as nimble. We won't be able to switch back and forth or get among several things as quickly as we did before. Short-term memory can become an issue. Long-term memory still seems to be there. And um, we find that uh, we can't memorize a list of words as easily as some younger people. But we've also found that some other skills, mental skills, improve actually as we get older. And do you know what those might be? Suggestion. Wisdom. I think, yes, wisdom in the sense of putting things in perspective better, which might be why older people tend to be less depressed. Social skills improve. People tend to be less angry. They tend to, uh, they tend to be more even, have a more level even person. Um, and slowing down might actually be good. They've, they've taken some elders and then people who are much younger and they've given them typing texts. And my gosh, the elders only type 34 words a minute and the youngsters type 75 words a minute. But they made many errors and the elders made none. So I discovered that older people may work more slowly, but they make fewer errors. And I think of it this way, that when you're 20, your brain is like a Maserati. And when you're 65 or older, your brain is like a Ford Taurus. It will still get you there, but it will take longer. And that's really some of the good news from it. Um, memory. We worry about memory. Does everyone here worry about memory loss? Do you have those moments where you think you're losing your memory? So you know that today, because of the era that we live in, we have the best memory prompt in the world in the palm of our hand, the smartphone. Mm -hmm. So I was watching uh, The Deer Hunter the other day on TV. Damn it, I could not remember the name of Meryl Streep's boyfriend who played a role in the movie, and I couldn't remember the year it was done. Did I stress? No. I asked Siri. <laughs> and she gave me the information. So for a lot of trivial things, and I have friends who know I write about the brains, they find me and say, you know, I can't remember the name of my fourth grade. And I'm really concerned because I used to be able to remember that. But I tell them you shouldn't sweat the small stuff, at least that's what the research shows. That um, don't worry if you can't remember where you left the car keys. But if you don't remember what they're for, then you should worry. <laughs> <laughs> and in terms of improving our memory, what we really want to improve is not our ability to retrieve sometimes meaningless information, but our ability to make choices and decisions, executive function. And that part of the brain is improved by exercising it. So, oh dear, I have to tell you about bad news first. I was going to tell you some things you can do to strengthen your brain, but let me tell you the bad news, because 
Every picture that I've been painting of the brain is fairly cheery, but as Betty Davis said, growing old ain't for sissies. <laughs> so one thing we have to recognize, of course, is that the older brain is going to be susceptible to a lot of problems that a younger brain may not. Um, there's an increased risk of non-brain conditions that will affect the durability of your brain. One of the most prominent ones is practically an epidemic in this country, diabetes. Diabetes is so bad for the brain, it doubles your risk of, of uh, dementia of some kind. Depression is bad for your brain, obesity, midlife high blood pressure is untreated. Let's see. Um, chronic stress. Chronic stress just kills those neurons, neurons dead. They found that, they found that looking again at, uh, at rats. Remember, we had the neurogenesis, they created new neurons, and they stressed them. The neurons disappear. Head injuries, and of course, as we get older, we have many, many experiences, and we may be exposed to life accidents that we can't control. So the brain you end up with is not necessarily the brain you earn, but there are some things you can do as you grow older, and you youngsters in the audience are in a good place to begin that, but it will help us oldsters too. Alzheimer's is not inevitable, nor are most kinds of dementia. There are ways to lower your risk, depending on your health situation, of course, and there are five areas that you can, that research is now showing you can do to maintain a healthy brain. What's the number one best thing you can do for your brain? It's better than sex. Exercise. Study after study after study shows this. There also were studies in which they had um, elders exercise and then looked at a control group that didn't exercise and then measured the weight of the hippocampus. And they found that those elders who had exercised, in this case it involved something like walking two miles three times a week, as opposed to being totally sedentary, had much larger hippocampus. They actually had something like one and a half to two percent increase in the weight of that, which doesn't sound significant, but that's a lot of neurons. Um, it also does things, exercise also helps, um, helps ameliorate all those other things that hurt your brain, right? Like type 2 diabetes, stroke, depression, stress. So, uh, Two hours of walking a week. That's what the guys did actually. That changed the age related shrinking of the hippocampus. And it doesn't have to be that. What other kinds of exercise can you do? Sex. Absolutely. <laughs> Sex. You can dance the tango, you can garden, you can bicycle, you can do Tai Chi. Yoga is really hot right now. Yoga is great for some weight bearing stuff, but yoga is probably not quite aerobic enough. And I'm just speaking to someone who does yoga three times a week. The second best thing you can do for your brain, number two. Six. Exactly. <laughs> number two. More sex. More sex. Challenge your brain. Do something new and difficult. And as we said, crossword puzzles? No, not for me anyway. If I work in my business for somebody else, maybe. Bridge. Something challenging, something new. Something that involves you making a lot of decisions and choices. And something you might not want to do. Learn a language, right? Uh, what else? Play a musical instrument. That's a twofer. Sex is a twofer, as we already mentioned, too. It can be challenging, right? Um, that's number three. Socialization. Extremely important. Research has found that, uh, that solitary confinement is as bad for your brain as torture. Right? That, that people in solitary confinement actually show measurable brain changes after a short amount of time. Um, so socialization is important. Again, remember, sex. Uh, my book about love, sex, and the brain actually is not about sex. This book really is, is more about the need for human connection. And remember we said the brain is not hardwired, it's flexible? The one area in which we truly are truly hardwired is our need for connection for human beings. So that's very important, and again, you can combine that with exercise, you can combine that with socialization and brain challenges. And what else is good for your brain? Four. Sleep. Sleep's not on the list, actually, but it is good for your brain. What else? Good nutrition. Good nutrition, obviously, contributes to good health and all those other reasons. And one other thing I found in doing my research is something called cognitive reserve. Who knows what cognitive reserve is? Yes? What is it? It means that you learn a lot when you were young. You did a lot of things 
Talking about using things with your brain throughout your life, yes. And some of the things, though, they talk about to contribute to this cognitive reserve are things involved with art and with music and with creative endeavors and not just, just things of achievement. So those are good. Um, rich emotional, spiritual, and creative activities to raise your mind. So that would be something good for you to start doing. The other thing that I, I did want to emphasize in all this talk is that uh, you can't take credit or blame for the good or bad about where your brain is now. But there's, there's so much that contributes to it. But you can, from this time on, move forward in doing things to help make your brain last longer, since our bodies are lasting longer. And I want to leave you with one other final thought that you should consider, and that's donating your brain. There are many organizations that would really like to look at your brain. They'd like to, especially a healthy brain. Presumably you're healthy when you die. Well, <laughs> I'm getting mixed up with you. Uh, you won't be healthy when you, well, you know what I mean. <laughs> Great. Do you have any questions or discussions? That someone will be around with the mic. How much time do we have? Oh, good, great. There's someone here, someone here. Don't ask one I can't answer, I'm old. Um, I don't know if I'm correct, but I thought I read when you do have an orgasm that all your neurons go off in your brain. That would be about a billion neurons. Uh, that's some sex. I, I don't think that's been substantiated, but it sounds like they use that term fire. Yeah. <laughs> Regarding uh, socialization, do you have any uh, statistics or studies on uh, over here? Oh, great. Right. Yeah. Do you have any uh, regarding social socialization? Do you have any statistics or studies on uh, uh, people who have pets, dogs, and cats? Uh, do that help? You know, people who may be isolated yeah. otherwise. Actually, one of the recommendations that you know I give in this book about what do there's an epidemic of loneliness internationally. More of us live alone, and we don't just live alone. Even people who believe you are lonely and isolated, and, I, and no one is quite sure what's brought that about. Probably a better standard of living in the developed world, ironically, has made us less dependent on others. But one of the things that is recommended is having something, some living thing in your life that you care about. I don't know of any studies offhand about pets, but it's a good idea for you to look up. And it's definitely, anecdotally, Having a pet's one of the best things you can do. Or a husband. <laughs> there was a whole flap about this 200 gram brain Oxford student who was so worth Whatever happened to those stories? People that had hypothecalism when they were very, very young, and it plastered their brains so they had very small, supposedly small brains, but they seem to function almost normally. Has that ever been followed up? I, I don't know, and I don't know about that. I do know about the one, the human activism, I think it's called where they, the hemisphere you know, is removed, literally half a brain. And those people, if it's done young enough especially, function perfectly normally. The other cases I haven't heard about. Sorry. Okay, over here. Um, I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about um, the role of art and music in brain health and there hasn't been a lot of research done on that. There was some research done, and I would have to refresh my memory in this. Uh, it's not in this book. There was some research done with, with um, an, an NEA or NHA grant, with an arts grant, that was given to people. And they, they took a bunch of elders, and they divided them up. And some of them just did you know, reading and writing, but others were exposed to various kinds of arts. Some were, were made active in dance programs, some in doing painting and drawing, some in doing theater. And at the end of the thing, when they, when they looked at everybody, they found that those people who had been exposed to the arts were functioning at a better level, these elderly people. But again, that's sort of a retrospect with really a controlled study. So I don't think there have been enough of those, and I think there should be more of them. Especially in this time when funding's being cut for things that essentially make us human and alive, and the arts is one of them. It, it's, we really, I guess, need to have more evidence to prove. It seems self-evident. You know, throughout history, how important art has been to all of us. But I guess we have to have more research to prove it to the people who are the bean counters. Yes? When you learn the language, your first language is supposed to go in one side of the brain, and then when you study a new language, it goes in the other one? This is the left brain, right brain. When you first study a language, it goes in one brain, when you study this, it goes in the other brain. No. 
where all brain is involved. And in fact, they've actually found that uh, people who know more than one language function better in life, they do better on skills, who just better in general. So having one, you had two, every bit. Very good. And a little bit more. I can um, say hello in five minutes. Is this on? Um, ten years ago, okay. ten oh, years ago, I made my living will and the plans thereafter, donating my body. And in California, at that point, I had to make a separate indication donating my brain. Wow. Is that still true, California? I don't know that that's true. I, I actually don't know. So, so I make heard. a note of it that yes. when you do that, it, it could still be a, a California law that you have to donate your brain separately. Well, that may be. There are, there are institutions and organizations that are interested in having your brain. I, I would suggest someone go to the NIH website and put Donate Your Brain in and find out, because the National Institute of Health must be a resource for that. In one of my books, which is not here, I have in the back of it um, a, a link to a place to go. I don't have the book with me now, I'm sorry. Okay, I think we'll do one more question. Not about sex. <laughs> Uh, is this, okay. uh, in terms of the, uh, what you call the epidemic of loneliness, yes. I wonder, you know, with so many people using social media while not necessarily interacting in person with other people, and uh, some people being very interested in virtual reality as some sort of escape from everyone, um, do you know if there have been any, any measurements of how well uh, something like using Facebook in your <laughs> in your uh, windowless room can actually make up for the isolation <laughs> and that sort of thing? Uh, there's been some research, and I don't have the data at hand, but there's some, been some research that says people who spend a lot of time on Facebook may become depressed. And I want to tell you that when I look at Facebook and I see all the exciting things all my friends are doing and how wonderful their lives are in full color, Instagram, I tend to get depressed. That's only part of the joke. Uh, I think there is a kind of envy and a feeling of um, feeling less worthy when you do that. So social media is difficult. And what what the research in this book showed is that we crave connection with another and we crave that in a physical way. Which is why even people 80 and 90 want sex. It isn't so much for the lighting up their brains and orgasm, although I'm sure that's nice. It's really that human touch, which is why having pets is important too. So um, I spend a lot of time on virtual media, promoting my books and things, and, and communicating with my friends. It's a great way to stay in touch. But it's not only really substitute for a living, breathing something in your life. Thanks for asking that. We're still good on time. We have about five more minutes for questions. Oh. But I will ask that you wait until someone comes to you with the microphone to ask your question. Maybe they're done. Oh, nope. Going right oh, no, sorry not. Yes? Uh, oh, wait, wait till someone comes with a microphone. I'm here. Oh, um, here. Yes, hi. What's the current status of uh, studies on meditation and meditation practices? Thank God you asked. I forgot to mention. Um, the Dalai Lama very kindly had made a number of his very, very long time meditating monks uh, to um, Richie Stavis. Thank you. And uh, they, they actually have their brains imaged in an FRI, functional magnetic um, resonance imaging, while they were meditating. And they've also had their brains examined later. What we're learning more and more about meditation is that it has extremely good effects on the brain. It, uh, it tends to uh, activate parts of the brain that are more or less connected with compassion. You know, the brain is not perfectly mapped, right? We just know the general areas. But those parts of the brain connected with compassion uh, tend to become more active. But the amygdala, which is, as you know, our, uh, our, our fight or flight center that protects us and becomes less active. And people tend to even out in temperament. So there's been an enormous amount of research done. And you might Google Richie Davidson um, and his research with the Dalai Lama Lamas. It's truly amazing. There's a lot of research on it showing how beneficial it is. How many meditators in this room? Wow. Great. Glad to hear that. I, I'm the last one, you know, pretty intensively for about 20 years and now occasionally, but it is really so beneficial for your brain and your body. It's a great question. Thank you. More? That's the information there. Donate your brain. Oh. NIH donates your brain. Okay. You go to Neurobiobank. N E U R O B I O B A N K at NIH.gov. 
How do you go just to NIH.gov and find it? Thank you. Very kind of you. Why do zombies like to eat our brains? <laughs> <laughs> Good. We have another one back here. McGregor, in the uh, myths that you were discussing, how do you account for the fact that uh, in certain fields, for instance, in mathematics, most uh, mathematicians do their best work when they're quite young, in their 20s and 30s, and then later on, they, their contributions tend to um, fall off? I don't know the answer to that. It is that certain skills are probably more dependent upon brains that are more active and nimble, the younger brains. But there are a number, and I, again, I sold so many books. Thank you all for buying them, but I don't have a reference. Um, there are so many people who continue making huge, major contributions, usually not in, in, area, in areas that are more philosophical and, uh, and more wide-ranging, and they've been doing that to old age. Mm -hmm. So was Einstein, who developed the theory of relativity. He was very young, but he continued to contribute until he was older. I, uh, Edison, Edison contributed until he was in his 60s or 70s. He was the younger great inventor of the 20th century. No, not Tesla. He was amazing. Um, no, Edison and someone else, but they made major contributions in their 40s, 50s, and 60s. So uh, I don't know why that tends to be true. I think some. My mind is not working the same way it did when I was in my 20s, but it was very quick. Flip back and forth between the things. A lot of it has to do with time to take a break from what you're normally doing. I signed actually fired from the job, right? Taking time off, yep. But that the question was why do some people peak earlier with brain functions? Younger people have more flexibility with their time. They have more flexibility with their time. Younger people? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he said they're very good until they're 30 when they discover sex. <laughs> no one really knows the answer to that question. There are some suppositions to that. So. Okay, we have a minute. So I think it's probably a good time to thank Judith for her wonderful talk. So this break is until 4.20.